Um, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, which is probably most of you, uh, my name is uh, Jason Hallett. I'm a professor in the chemical engineering department at Imperial College and one of the um, topic group leaders for the Supergen Bioenergy Hub, specifically on the pretreatment and conversion topic. And we're going to have a series of webinars later on today um, talking about anaerobic digestion from the point of view of Supergen. Um, this is to help us scope an upcoming uh, funding call, a flexible funding call, looking at the big challenges facing um, the UK in the field of anaerobic digestion today and how that can fit in with the aims of the Supergen Bioenergy Hub. From our particular topic group, I think at the moment where I see the biggest overlap um, is in terms of our finding new and more exciting uses um, of waste biomass. Um, we've been, I, I've personally been working quite a bit recently on um, heavily contaminated pre and post consumer waste wood, usually contaminated with heavy metals and other toxins. And we've been looking at downstream uses for the cellulose that we can isolate from that, everything from materials to um, bioethanol to um, various bits of um, catalytic products. Um, we have uh, conversion topics on fermentation, on photocatalysis, and also on thermochemical conversion, but nothing on anaerobic digestion, which is, of course, one of the UK's um, leading bioenergy vectors, especially for the use of um, sugars. And looking at sugars from waste, I would say that uh, anaerobic digestion is certainly one of the, the big topics, um, and we're, uh, we're a little bit remiss in that we don't have any activity on that. So hopefully um, everyone in attendance today, and especially our presenters, can help us scope out what these challenges are and how they might fit in with Supergen. Um, am I handing over to Emma or, or uh, Patricia? Let's go, Hi. Patricia. I think okay. it was me next, Jason, yeah. Uh, okay, so thank you everyone. So I will hand over now to Patricia Thornley, the director of the Supergen Bioenergy Hub. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, I was on another call with other people, so I missed the start of this. I do apologise, but I heard the end there from Jason. I'm just going to do a very brief introduction to what Supergen is. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this, so I'm not going to labour it um, too much. Um, can we have the next slide, Dan or Emma? OK, actually, go back up to the title one. That's great. OK, so yeah, so Supergen is funded by the UK government. It is one of several hubs. Um, that are funded by EPSRC. We are uniquely funded jointly by EPSRC and BBSRC. Um, so BBSRC are the Biological and Biochemical Research Council. And our job is to sit across academia and connect them with industry, government and societal stakeholders to develop sustainable bioenergy systems. So there's a lot of work goes on at different universities in the UK and Supergen brings all of that together to be a holistic offering around bioenergy on behalf of UK PLC. So let's move down, Emma. Is it Emma doing it? Yeah. OK, um, the way we structure ourselves is that we have a topic group focusing on resources and that looks at options for the production of enough feedstock in the UK. So that involves mapping of different land types and different productivities. It involves looking at competing uses in different parts of um, the country. And it involves also characterising the feedstocks that we get um, in terms of their um, performance and availability. That work is led by Ian Donison at the University of Aberystwyth. Um, we then move into pretreatment and conversion, and Jason is one of our topic group leads on that, along with Tony Bridgewater at Aston and Chris Hardacre up in Manchester. And I think he's just given a bit of an overview on the fact that we look at the um, pretreatment, particularly Jason has been looking at heavily contaminated wastes because we believe that wastes are a big part of the UK's bioenergy future. Um, and also um, looking at the conversion technologies with a focus on thermal technologies at Aston and catalytic technologies at Manchester. So one of the reasons we're including this topic in our flexible funding call is the need to have more focus on the biological um, and biochemical processes within Supergen. This flex funding is deliberately intended to enable that, and that is really the point of why we are here today. 
But there's a little bit about vectors as well. The vectors um, topic is led by Marcel McManus at the University of Bath. And this is about what do we convert biomass to in order for it to be useful? Now, in the case of AD, the answer may seem obvious that we're converting to biogas. But actually, many of the issues with AD revolve not so much around the biogas, but around the digestate and the other byproducts that we may end up with. Also, on what we use that biogas for. In a world where we're heading to net zero by 2050, it may not always make sense to simply use the biogas as it is, or even to upgrade it as has conventionally been done to methane. So alternative ways of using the biogas product are something that um, would be very much within the scope of this call um, if that's what people are interested in. So this is preferred bioenergy pathways, energy vectors, and how those fit within an overall strategy. Um, past work that has been done here has included things like looking at leakage around AD plants and um, looking at um, integration of thermochemical and biological approaches um, with AD and um, thermochemical work going on side by side in the same system, which brings me on to topic group four, which is all about systems. This is led by Miriam Rodder um, at Aston University and is about looking at bioenergy and its impact within the overall UK energy system. And I say energy system, but we also look at the land system, we look at the food system, and we see where all of those interfaces sit. So there's work going on there on the um, greenhouse gas um, balances associated with this on indirect um, land use change on the wider impacts and the societal impacts associated with um, bioenergy. The systems theme looks at environment, but also on economics and markets and a particular focus on people and their um, perceptions of bioenergy. And I would just point anyone who hasn't already seen it to the recently published um, report by the UK Climate Assembly, which actually gives the perspective of the citizens of the UK, a microcosm um, of the demographic of the UK, on a range of climate um, options, including um, bioenergy. And it makes quite interesting reading. We also have some case studies um, which look at the role and the impact of different bioenergy pathways. They effectively bring everything that's happening in topic groups one to four together to focus on particular pathways um, for production of bioenergy. And that is where we do our full life cycle and, and analysis of impact. Next one, please, Emma. Oh, it's Dan. Sorry, I've read the chat now. Um, OK, I, I've talked through most of this already that we've got the topic group on resources, pretreatment conversion vectors. The important addition here is the bit at the bottom, what Supergen is all about, really. All of this can happen in individual research projects. And the call that we have out today is indeed for individual research projects. But the value of doing this with the hub is all about the bit on the bottom. It's about the impact within our bioenergy community in the UK, that we can improve cooperation between partners, we can integrate work and disciplines, we can get the science and engineering talking to each other better, and we can also get improved industrial understanding. The call that I've just left was with um, four of our main industrialists who are working with us on low carbon liquids and gases. So it's about getting that shared vision in order to move forward um, as a society with bioenergy implementation. We also are really keen to engage our early career researchers in these calls. And that's one of the reasons they're quite low value um, so that we can try and do things that are short term and can benefit early career researchers in trying to build their funding portfolio. Um, as part of that, we also have ECR training via our share network open to all people who are members of the Supergen Hub. Um, we also have impact outside the hub. So I've just mentioned industry companies, professional bodies. Yes, we had a trade association on the previous call as well. And indeed, we had one of the catapults on the previous call. So yes, we, we're in constant contact with these people. And it is expected that whatever gets funded in this call will be brought to them. They will comment on it. They will work with people on it and give feedback on it. Um, we also work very closely um, uh, with different government departments. Um, there are about nine government departments whom we regularly convene with um, and have conversations about the future of bioenergy. So any work that has a policy component or indeed is policy relevant would be particularly welcome. 
And I've already mentioned people and their importance. Um, so the society, public engagement, NGOs and media elements are also important. And I think part of the thing here is that we do have the resources within Supergen to support that. So if you bring the fundamental ideas along that and are willing to go out a little bit into some of this stuff around, you know, societal engagement, public engagement, policy stuff, we can support you in Supergen with doing that, try and arrange the right meetings and connections, and that helps to highlight the research much better. I think we're on to the last one now, please, Dan. OK, so a picture of um, the people who've signed our current consortium agreement. Um, this is a constantly moving feast. I'm sure there are more by now. But just to give you an idea of the sort of companies and universities that we currently cover. And the last one, please. OK, back to Jason. Thank you. talking to my screen. Outstanding, thank you. And I don't think uh, I, I would have guessed that Patricia has done that uh, introduction to the hub about 470,000 times. <laughs> she, seems, she seems perfectly fresh every time I hear it. Um, so next we have got a, so, so now that Patricia's given an overview of the hub, next uh, Emma Wild um, is going to give a, an overview of um, sort of the flexible funding calls within Supergen which will lead into our webinars and the discussion about the anaerobic digestion call that will be coming up. Emma. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, I'm Emma Wild. I'm the Supergen Bioenergy Hub Project Manager, and I just wanted to talk to you today about the Supergen flexible funding calls that we've got coming up. Next slide, please, Dan. Uh, so within Supergen, we have a pot of flexible funding, um, which is assigned for various purposes, and we will be having a challenge call, which will launch in October 2020 for two projects of £100,000 each, and that call will focus on three areas, uh, anaerobic digestion and substitute gases, which we're talking about today, global land use change, which we had a webinar on on the 9th of um, September, and algae and marine feedstocks, for which we have another webinar next Monday. Um, in October 2020, uh, we will also launch a call for two Supergen fellowships to, um, to allow early career researchers to develop their careers and, and have a fellowship within one of the host institutes of the hub. Um, we also have an open call for rapid response funding of up to £25,000 per project. Uh, and this money is available to carry out research within, with, which has high immediate impact and generally involves working with industry to try and uh, create a small project which is of immediate value and impact for society. Um, all of our flexible funding is available to anyone who is a Supergen Hub member. And if you're not sure about whether your institute is a member, then please get in touch with me and I will clarify that for you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, so this particular call, the challenge call that we're launching at the start of October, as I've said before, is for two projects of £100,000 each and is going to address three main areas. Uh, the priorities for the call will be identified during these webinars that we're ho hosting in September and will be there will be priorities on each of the uh, on each of these topics um, all proposals submitted will be expected to be collaborative with other institutes and aligned to the objectives of supergen hub uh, we expect significant engagement with the hub uh, including presenting at our progress meetings and, uh, and providing us updates on progress and impact of the projects all proposals should deliver impacts which can be reported to the research councils and the Supergen website as this is part of the Supergen project. Uh, next slide please Dan. So this is just an outline of the uh, challenge call timetable. So we plan to issue the call on the 5th of October. Closing date will be 30th of November and then we will have all our decisions made mid-January uh, for projects to start in February, March time uh, next year. OK, that's I think that's it from me. Next slide, please. Yeah, OK. Oh, OK, thank you. 
Hello. Um, to recap, then, um, before we before we move into the talks, um, at the beginning, I gave a brief overview of um, the uh, interests of the Supergen Biology Hub, particularly in anaerobic digestion, and how we're looking to expand um, the pretreatment and conversion um, topic groups activities into more and more interesting and I don't know impactful energy vectors. Um, as Patricia said, and as I said at the start, um, from, from the point of view of topic group two, this is, I think, especially dovetails well with our interest in uh, finding better uses for waste in the, in the UK. Um, from a selfish point of view, from my own research, since we've been working quite a bit on, I guess what you could say is decontaminating um, high energy uh, organic feedstocks, finding an outlook, uh, outlook, an outlet for those decontaminated feedstocks, I think is of particular interest. And I would personally be very happy to, to, to see what's going on in this space um, and how we might be able to take advantage of, of the opportunities that are arising. And to help us scope out what those opportunities are, um, we have a, a distinguished list of speakers. Um, and leading off that, uh, that lineup is going to be Martin Freer, who's a professor at uh, the University of Birmingham and director of the Birmingham Energy Institute. And uh, Martin has put up um, the uh, Energy from Waste in the Circular Economy report that was just issued um, uh, as, as part of the policy initiatives in the UK government looking at the circular economy, which has been a huge topic, um, certainly in the UK government. I, I first saw it, uh, must be close to 10 years ago, um, when we, the, and the House of Lords report came out a few years ago, and there's been a lot of um, activities informing um, better and better uh, engagement of UK industry with the circular economy. And certainly the BEI uh, has been at the forefront um, in terms of, of that transition. So with no further ado, Martin, would you please enlighten us on uh, energy and waste in the circular economy in the UK? Uh, I'll do my best and, and thank you for, very much for that introduction, Jason. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present here some of the, some of the thinking which came out of that, uh, that policy commission, which as you can see, I uh, was led by Robin Teverson, Lord Teverson. Um, so, um, Dan, if you could uh, go forward, I think it's probably the next slide as well. Um, that's it, that's great. So, so what this commission was designed to do um, is to look at two, two big challenges that we have. Um, one is how to develop a, a practical uh, and realisable circular economy. Uh, and the second element is how to do that in a way which is sustainable in all senses, not just in terms of resources that we have, but also how to make that low carbon. Um, and how best to think about how one generates energy uh, and energy in its broadest sense. So raw energy as electricity and heat, um, but also the fuels which might be extracted out of uh, out of that. So, so how to make something which uh, squares the circle of maximising the benefits of the resources that we have, but also uh, making sure that we don't do that in a carbon intensive way. Um, the, the starting point um, is, this, is, is this lovely graphic from National Geographic, which shows at the top there the resources that we have uh, from the natural world, um, so minerals, ores, fossil fuels, etc. Uh, and then through some uh, complicated uh, uh, spaghetti of processes, uh, what emerges at the bottom are, are commodities. Um, uh, so, so things like housing, um, mobility, healthcare, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and then below that is what happens to those resources once we finish using them. Uh, some of them, most of them, end up being disposed of into the environment. Uh, some of them are locked up in building materials slightly longer term. Uh, and a very small amount is uh, is recycled. Uh, and of course, the the challenge is to is to shift uh, the uh, the fraction which is recycled uh, significantly. Uh, Dan, next next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, of course, as uh, Jason said, there's there's been a lot of thinking put into uh, the circular economy. Uh, we have this waste hierarchy which uh, has a series of interventions which uh, include recycling, reprocessing, energy recovery, and then finally, if you can't do anything else, uh, disposal. 
uh, and there are uh, more sophisticated ways of looking at that as delivered by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And you can see here two, uh, two examples of a, a technical cycle and a biological cycle. Uh, on the technical side, there's things that you can do, such as refurbishment uh, and maintenance, which reduces the flow of resources through um, through that uh, that uh, waste hierarchy. Um, on the biological side, uh, of course, you've got the topic of today, which is anaerobic digestion. Uh, and uh, as indicated here, the production of, of biogas. Um, but the question is, well, you, well, you, as, it, as illustrated, you can burn that biogas and that produces carbon. Can you make that even lower carbon uh, than it is at the moment? Um, and that might involve capturing some of the carbon emissions as, as part of that, um, that combustion. Um, so uh, the, the next slide uh, shows how the UK is doing in terms of its uh, management of its waste as uh, as a function of time, in fact, over the last uh, 15 or so years. Uh, and what one sees is a series of bars there, uh, the lowest set of bars, uh, is the, the landfill component fraction uh, has reduced significantly over time. Um, and that's that's great. That has been driven largely by the landfill tax and local authorities managing their waste uh, in different ways. Uh, the uh, the uh, recycling component, uh, the top of the bar there, the, perhaps the darkest blue, has, has grown, um, but in recent years has plateaued. Um, so the, the issue there is uh, the fraction that we are recycling is, is not increasing with time in, in recent years. Uh, the thing which has increased is the amount of waste that is being putting, put through uh, incineration or energy from waste plants, um, as, as they are called. Um, with a click, Dan, uh, one sees again the landfill decreasing, like blue line. Uh, energy from waste increasing, but the other component which uh, is in our waste uh, stream is the export of waste. And that is something which uh, no longer will we have the luxury of exporting our waste and we need to do more with it. Uh, on, on, the, on the next slide, one sees from a UK perspective how we are doing in terms of our waste management uh, and comparing that with our European colleagues. Um, so left hand side of this um, sequence here is uh, is good. Right hand side is not so good. Uh, red is red is landfill. Uh, yellow is waste to energy and uh, the green is uh, recycling and composting. And you see that UK is about equal measures of energy from waste and uh, and uh, uh, and recycling. Um, and you, you might argue that actually, if you look at Sweden and Denmark, um, we're, we're, we're doing quite well. Um, but this, uh, and in fact, we're sitting uh, towards the left of centre uh, rather than over at the hard right, um, at least in waste terms, if not political. So, so uh, the, uh, the next slide actually unpicks that a little bit more, which is how well are we doing in terms of extracting from our energy from waste the maximum value that we can uh, from those waste streams? Uh, and what see, one sees is that uh, in Sweden and Denmark, so the vertical axis is megawatt hours per ton, uh, the, in Sweden and Denmark, uh, much more energy is extracted than in the UK. Uh, and uh, what this means is uh, it's uh, our energy from waste sector is performing in a rather miserable way. And the reason for that is we focus almost exclusively on electricity rather than uh, the full extraction of the energy from the system, which includes heat. Uh, and if we want to do better, then actually we need to extract much more of the heat. Uh, next, uh, next slide. <coughs> illustrates uh, what we could do in terms of what's best in class. Uh, this is uh, Copenhagen. Uh, this is a wonderful plant, which is about 500,000 tonne plant uh, per year um, of waste um, based uh, within the city or close to the city, which feeds heat uh, into the heat networks uh, around, uh, around the city. 
and uh, there's uh, there's great opportunities for for the for the UK doing um, some, some something similar. Uh, and uh, if you look on top of this waste to energy plant, there is a uh, there's a wonderful ski slope which um, people can ski down or even uh, climb up. Is that the end of my presentation? It would appear so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but thank you very much, Martin. Um, I uh, I appreciate uh, that I, I gave everyone quite a strict directive on on uh, having uh, these these quick focus presentations. Um, I, can I, well, just to, just to skip through quickly then have to the end. Um, so Dan, uh, let's just do that. So roles for doing things better. Um, so. Uh, this, uh, the chart here on the left-hand side shows anaerobic digestion has been increasing uh, and there's, I think, a lot of potential for doing things better around anaerobic digestion uh, and improving uh, the rollout of that technology. Um, next slide. Slide. Um, the other thing that I think we need to do better is to make sure that we're capturing the carbon associated with our waste processing. Uh, and uh, here is illustrated technology by CCM, who uh, can take the digestate from uh, anaerobic digestion and combine it with CO2 uh, to provide a fertilizer um, and uh, carbonate on the right hand side of course, technology which can take air pollution control residues and convert those with CO2 capture into building materials. We need to be doing much more of that and probably last slide. Um, and the proposition that, uh, that we had is that we can combine all of these uh, um, processes and processing into what's called a resource recovery cluster. Um, and here what you have is the, the manufacturing. Uh, you combine the manufacturing and the waste streams from the manufacturing with reprocess and recycling. Think about the fuels which are created and uh, using those fuels back into the manufacturing process. So there's kind of a, uh, a synergistic relationship that one can create here in terms of waste processing, recycling uh, and energy production. And I'll stop there. And I, I apologise for not, not being able to stick to time. No, I, actually, Martin, you're perfectly fine on time. I, th I think we were just having technical difficulties there in the middle. That's all. Oh, well, OK, if I've got one more slide then, yeah, Jason. That's fine, that's fine. Uh, let's go to the end one, um, which is what the rec key recommendations were of the uh, of the Policy Commission. I mean, there was many, but let, let's pull out a few. Um, the first is that uh, it's nuts not to be properly exploiting fully the energy which is produced uh, in uh, our energy from waste system. Um, uh, and that's in its broadest sense, but uh, focuses very strongly on uh, the energy from waste plants and that uh, what we should be doing is connecting the waste heat from those into district heating uh, systems. But the other is rec recognising that we've got a series of technologies which are emergent uh, and need supporting through into market. And those are both on the, um, the waste processing side, so uh, anaerobic digestion and pyrolysis and gasification. All of these are technologies which many companies are developing, um, but need support through that demonstration phase. Uh, in order to de-risk future investment. Uh, and then the, the other thing which needs supporting is uh, carbon capture technologies uh, and better integration of carbon capture and utilisation technologies with uh, that, that waste processing. Um, so we uh, suggested that, uh, and there's an argument for, uh, a series of uh, our resource recovery clusters across the Midlands. Um, and that there is a need for better understanding resource flows, um, as in countries like Taiwan. Um, and uh, the proposition there is a national centre for the circular economy, um, but also uh, a grand challenge, an R&D grand challenge around small scale circular um, carbon capture uh, uh, te technology. So, so integrating waste um, production, uh, waste processing with uh, carbon capture. Thank you for your patience. <clears throat> okay.
Thank you, Martin. I, I have to say, uh, for, first of all, the, the report was a, was an excellent, if nothing else, I mean, it was, it was a great source of, of diagrams. I, I always, I'm a, I'm a sucker for a good Sankey diagram. And certainly between the, the one in the circular economy report here, and uh, for example, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's uh, famous one on, uh, on plastics recycling, um, always gives a, a, a very good visual idea of just how linear our economy is at the moment and uh, I guess you could say how much work we have to do um, in implementing the circular economy. So thank you Martin for that. It was a wonderful overview of, uh, of the field. Our next speaker is Nick Primer from the ADBA, which is the Anaerobic Digestion and Bioresources Association. And when Nick's slides pop up, um, Nick's going to... There we go. It's coming. Trust me. I think uh... there we go. And so yep, Nick is going to give us an overview, uh, I guess, an industrial perspective um, on uh, how AD can can uh, can reach its full potential. So Nick, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah. So as um, as was mentioned, yeah, I'm going to give a pretty broad overview of what the, the AD industry is currently achieving. And then looking at how it can grow and reach its full potential and what are the barriers and the main things that research and innovation can help overcome to to sort of establish these more circular economy principles within the UK. So at the moment, uh, the current industry, so this is based on our industry database, uh, the ADBA database pipeline, which um, you know sort of collects all the all the data from every single operational plant in the UK. Uh, AD plant in the UK. So at the moment we estimate that it's the, the industry processes around 33 million tonnes of feedstock per year. You know that comprises of food waste, sewage sludge, uh, agricultural manure, slurries, crop residues, you know the whole lot. And that is currently being fed into some CHP plants and biomethane plants, the majority being CHP plants at the moment. And uh, you know, sort of per per plant, that is a much lower um, and total capacity per plant than uh, compared to biomethane plants, which tend to be much larger. So, uh, based on some industry average load factors uh, of about 73% across the UK, uh, we can estimate the the amount of energy, the renewable energy output from these plants per year. So from the CHP plants, you're getting about 10 terawatts of electricity per year and 15 terawatt hours of heat. And as the last presentation said, you know, like a lot of that heat isn't even being utilised and captured. Um, and that is something that, you know, it's, it's a wasted resource of, of, of renewable green heat that should be better utilised. On the other side, you've got the about 5.5 terawatt hours of biomethane produced and injected into the grid per year. And then of course, there's the, uh, the highly valuable digestate, you know, recycling the nutrients back to the land. And based on, you know, an, a, a general sort of rule of thumb of 90% by weight of your feedstock gets converted to digestate, you can estimate there's about 30 million tonnes of digestate produced per year. And in the case of biomethane and when you, you know, produce your biogas and you upgrade it to biomethane and siphon off that bio CO2, uh, you know, it, this is currently being more often than not being vented into the atmosphere, which is, you know, um, you know, within a within a, a carbon neutral system, but you know this is an opportunity to capture that concentrated CO2 and either utilize it or, or store it. Uh, it's again, something uh, research and innovation can help overcome. But overall, we estimate that there's about 5.1 uh, 5.1 million tons of CO2 being abated in the UK per year by the AD industry. That represents about one one percent of the UK's um, total emissions. So then looking at the full potential, so this is, um, you know, quite a conservative estimate whereby we're reducing waste production as much as possible. You know, food waste is halved in the UK. Um, and, you know, we're also looking at sort of very reasonable uh, or, or sort of conservative collection rates. We're not assuming every single gram of organic material is being diverted to AD. It's, uh, it's a bit more pragmatic approach. So we, we estimate that that realistically obtainable feedstock is about 150 million tonnes. So we're currently achieving about one fifth of its full potential in the UK. So that we would hope to go to primarily biomethane plants. You know, that is the most efficient use of the, the energy output. You know, you're not it's not being wasted uh, potentially as heat. I know that can be captured, but it's a more usable, storable form of energy, helping balance the, uh, the grid. 
and you know it's it's highly compatible with the existing infrastructure. Um, and then yeah, as as I say, so we we estimate that that can produce about uh, fifty one terawatt hours of biomethane per year. Um, and then you can get an additional 20 terawatt hours of biomethane if you integrate it with power to gas. So, but using the uh, the bio C2 produced um, through the upgrading process, feeding that back into the di uh, feeding hydrogen, renewable hydrogen into the digester that binds with that bio C2 to produce further biomethane, converting the process from a carbon negative uh, carbon neutral technology to a carbon negative technology while producing more biogas. Uh, by methane. And at that stage, uh, we estimate the industry would uh, abate 27.2 uh, 27 million tonnes of CO2 per year, which is about 5-6% of the UK's total emissions. So how do we uh, so how do we sort of get to that full potential? How do we really grow the industry and make best use of our bioresources? So the uh, I've identified four sort of key barriers. The first one is to better commercialise the AD to reduce the reliance on subsidies. So at the moment, you know, the AD plants will only be built and only can operate sort of profitably, sort of, you know, feasibly with um, with existing government support. So that could be the feed-in tariff or the RHI or the upcoming green gas support scheme. Um, and all of this, you know, it, it's, it's about, it, they, they get rewarded for the amount of gas or renewable energy produced. So the first thing to help bring down those costs, uh, bring down the government spending and sort of make it more self-reliant, you know, improving the biogas yields that could be from uh, and increasing productivity. So that could be improving sort of the enzymes used within the biodigesters. There's some really exciting innovations going on there. Uh, looking at new ways of just eking out more gas, uh, sort of further exit, you know, additional digestion processes, different tanks to sort of um, attack different types of organic material. Um, you know, there's improving the quality and value of its other outputs, you know, looking at improving the digestive quality and, you know, and, and with it, its value. Is there other other higher use values? Um, you know, there's been the various research projects looking at growing algae through digestate, recycling those nutrients through there, creating a higher value product. Uh, so again, bringing that revenue back into an AD plant through through its various other environmental roles. Uh, and then, yeah, using the bio CO2. So as I sort of mentioned, can that be used to create more renewable uh, energy or perhaps that could be captured, stored and some kind of value placed on its ability to reduce the carbon emissions within the UK. And overall, the whole industry, you know, any innovation that can help bring down the capital and operational costs of the AD operation, you know, the lower the cost, the more that the, the, the natural products it produces can be commercially viable. And again, without that reliance on subsidies, the, the industry can sort of really grow on its own. So the next point is how do we increase that, um, that feedstock going to AD? And it's not just about the uh, quantity, it's about the quality. So looking at pre-treatment processes, reducing the amount of contamination and getting that highest quality material being fed to AD. Um, yeah, so and that, that will feed down through the entire system, you know, more, more feedstock available. There'll be more plants, more energy produced, more nutrients recycled. And, and you know, this whole thing will increase that um, the, the amount of carbon abated from the UK's operations per year. So uh, the third barrier is convert CHPs to biomethane plants where possible. So as I mentioned, the majority of plants at the moment are, are CHP plants producing electricity and heat, but only really utilising the electricity on the whole. So, but, but there are plenty of renewable technologies that can generate electricity. You know, wind and solar are, are sort of booming industries at the moment. Um, and, you know, they're, for, for producing electricity, they're more cost effective. AD works as a sort of a more broader scheme, able to recycle these organic materials. Um, you know, its production of e energy, while is incredibly valuable, it's not the only thing it can do. Uh, and and that sort of carbon abatement is better, well, is it sort of optimised uh, if more plants are producing biomethane? It's uh, you know there aren't many technologies that that are ready to use, uh, compatible with the current sort of gas network, capable of 
storing and balancing the uh, the energy network. So biomethane is a far more valuable resource. You know, it can really decarbonize some of the trickiest sectors. And, uh, and finally, the point four is the integration with power to grass systems and bio refining. Like, I think it's sort of at least generally agreed, at least within government or at least thought of, that hydrogen is going to be the ultimate solution. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the UK is always going to produce organic wastes. And so it's about optimising the use of this valuable bio resource. And at the moment, AD is a ready to use technology. You know, we need to be cutting emissions immediately. So, um, you know, making it best use of the uh, these bio resources through AD and, you know, looking at that waste hierarchy, uh, AD is the top of the sort of recycling stage. Um, you know, so so making making the biomethane and perhaps in the future when hydrogen sort of takes over, that biomethane can be converted easily to uh, green hydrogen through steam reformation. Or in the meantime, when hydrogen infrastructure isn't quite ready, uh, hydrogen can be fed into the AD uh, plant and used to create further biomethane. So that is a, it's a really flexible system and sort of making sure that innovation is there to to sort of adapt the uh, the processes to suit the needs of of the energy network. Um, and yeah, as I've mentioned as well, other things include things like the, the uh, carbon capture and storage, you know, making sure that that's fully integrated within these systems. Um, you know, it, compared to direct air capture, you, you've got the carbon dioxide ready, high concentrations, it's ready to be stored um, and utilised. So it's a a way of further reducing emissions of greatly as they're already being captured. Um, so yeah, that's really all for me. So just to sort of summarise those key four points again, I'll leave them on screen for a second. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's about making it more cost effective, making the industry less reliant on the uh, government subsidies and also making mapping it into that future pathway uh, to the sort of future energy network. So that's all for me and thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. Um, I appreciate the uh, overview there. Um, I, I also, uh, it reminded me of a lot of things actually, but uh, you highlighted at the end there, I thought very nicely, this, what, certainly in Supergen, but in the wider academic community, we always talk about the systems challenges um, in dealing with, with energy systems in particular, um, and how there are a lot of different options for integrating um, CCS, CHP, um, direct biomethane conversion, whether or not the grid is going to be carrying methane or hydrogen uh, 30 years from now and, and those sorts of questions. Um, and it's really, really interesting to see how those how those interplay with, you know, the, the, the transition, I guess, of the industry. A couple of uh, public service announcements, I guess, that, uh, that I was remiss in not highlighting earlier. Um, we are, of course, as I say, having a panel discussion at the end with our, our speakers um, a answering questions from the audience and helping us to scope out the, the call surrounding the, uh, the specific challenges that we're facing in integrating ED, ED, AD into the SuperGem Bioenergy Hub. Um, and so please do keep uh, sending in questions um, and we'll be answering, uh, I, I guess, some of my favorites, but uh, some, some of the most uh, tricky ones. Um, at the end, so so please do keep sending those in. So thank you. Our next speaker is Sandra Estevez from the University of South Wales. Um, Sandra is, uh, you know, each of our speakers has been uh, kind enough to sort of cover a, a differing aspect um, uh, related to this uh, to this challenge. Sandra is rep uh, representing sort of the academic uh, research community and what sort of the cutting edge of, of UK research is um, in terms of uh, in terms of this topic area. So Sandra, please. Thank you very much, Jason, and thanks for the um, invitation to present here today. I'm professor uh, in bioprocess technology at uh, the University of uh, South Wales and looking at resource recovery, mainly energy and materials as well. Uh, today's topic is, is quite broad, but really focuses on, on work that we've been uh, doing, uh, where we feel that anaerobic processes uh, really are at the heart of the circular economy and also energy storage aspects as well. So please, the next slide. 
Uh, just for the ones that don't know us, um, we've we've started in anaerobic digestion for a number of decades, um, and and these are the areas that we've acquired through the years um, uh, and, and and link with with the technology itself. Um, later in 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 the last few years, we've been working on hydrogen quite a lot, uh, biopolymer production, and uh, and more recently. Um, uh, CO2, uh, methane and, and CO conversion to products as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just a very uh, quick picture on what we might find if you do visit us. So we've got a number of digesters on site uh, and we also have the pleasure of working with industry and, you know, the 7000 meter cube digesters when we can get hold of them. Um, so we're very grateful for industry to to partner with us on 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 developments within within the, uh, the technology. Uh, we've got a number of um, uh, systems uh, from smaller scale to larger scale in the labs and and in the last few years we've invested quite a lot in also gaseous conversion so we feel that uh, there there is uh, there is value to be gained from from co2 uh, there is there is other uh, products that can be produced from methane too uh, so we, we're concentrating on those areas as well uh, next slide please uh, just very briefly, we 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 great believers of uh, real time monitoring and uh, general monitoring as a whole. Uh, so we've we've concentrated through through decades of of uh, of work uh, in measuring things. So measuring the chemistries, measuring the the, the profiling of microbes in, in digesters, because if we don't measure things, we don't know what's going on, what's happening, where there is the inhibition, whether there is elements that aren't being digested, what's the quality of digestate and so on. So this is just uh, a picture of a technique that we've been developing um, based on FTNIR. Um, so it's basically a sensor that we can put at multi stages of, of the AD process where we can tell us, uh, you know, uh, the characteristics of those feedstocks, of those matrices in the digester of the of the digestate, but also can be a tool that can tell us whether the digester is operating normally. If you look on the right hand side, you know, uh, around the center of that of that graph is normal operation or is starting to deviate to to status that we need to uh, to be looking at more closely, either inhibition or failure coming coming along the bottom graph there. You can actually see, you know, the ability to pick up disturbances, whether it's in the feed or whether the, the HRT, the retention time has changed and things like that. So so there are ways of actually understanding how the process is doing and, and how what we need to do in order to make it uh, work better. Next slide, please. Um, just again, a, a picture of, uh, you know, multiple parameters that can be monitored. And for example, the top one, uh, a graph there uh, on the left, you can see the relationship between ammonia and what's happening with microbial population. So as ammonia increases, it creates inhibition. There is a decrease, for example, of um, acetate utilizers. So it's not it's not really a black box um, approach is uh, if you measure things, you end up finding why why your digester is not working uh, as you would hope to, to, to work. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see a number of measurements that we've took over 500 odd days in a digester where we look at profiling of, of the microbes and understanding why we're getting those chemistries as well and, and how the chemistry is influencing the microbes. Just really just to, to give you a feel that uh, by monitoring, you, you can make a black box uh, tank, tank to actually operate on more uh, visible uh, approach. Next slide, please. Um, just a very quick brief of a project that we're running currently um, has got a number of uh, industrialists, um, eight companies in total, and we're looking at CO2 conversion, utilization, uh, recovery and utilization, heat recovery, uh, nutrient and metal recovery, um, and, and we're looking at other, other uh, um, molecules as well, enzymes and, and peptides and, and um, nucleic acids, etc. from, from these digestate. Um, we continue on, on, on process monitoring too. Um, next slide, please. Um, when, one area that we've uh, concentrated uh, in the last couple of years has been a technique called GCIMS. 
and it really uh, is, is a good technique to deploy for looking at all volatile uh, matter that we can um, be measuring either at feedstock at, at digest state level uh, and here um, and, and for the ones that have worked with the anaerobic digestion for some time will know that the intermediates specifically volatile fatty acids are, are important measurements so with this technique we've been able to to start focusing on on getting some real-time measurement of, uh, of 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 the acids within the digesters so it's, it really tells us when things start to go wrong or if if we're going to produce volatile fatty acids then uh, as, as another type of output in these in these processes we can start utilizing these techniques too next slide please um, picking up on another technique, on the left hand side, uh, you will see graphs that indicate measurements of solids. You know, it's quite frustrating that, you know, getting to the 21st century and we still unable to measure organic loads properly in digesters. So we've been we've been trying to address that. And we've got now a model that with the sensor that we can utilize of actually mo monitoring uh, very closely organic loads, both at, at total solids and a volatile uh, solid as well and you can see on the left the predictions and the actual measurements fit in very nicely for a wide range of solids on the right hand side these are measurements for volatile fatty acids as well and we've got some work to do further on, on this technique but we believe that actually is a multiple parameter technique that can measure a number of things from carbon to nitrogen ratio volatile fatty acids solids etc so instead of having a multitude of sensors we could deploy one sensor and actually get feedback on a number of parameters that can be used for optimization. Next slide, please. Um, this is work that we've done on, for example, recovering ammonia from digesters and the impact that is had on, on these um, digesters. These are high uh, sewage sludge content digesters after thermal hydrolysis, actually. And by removing ammonia, we can actually get more 50% or so more in terms of biogas. And it tells us uh, how we've managed to get there. We've got much better efficiency at removing the acids. And on the right hand side, you can see what actually happens in terms of microbial concentrations as well. So we've been able to, to increase the density of microbes in their activity in digesters. Next slide, please. Uh, one area that we're focusing currently is actually on flexible methane production. For example, if, if we inject into the gas grid, there are daily variations of, of demand uh, that we would like to, to be able to meet, in, uh, to, to meet those demands. But uh, more importantly, there is um, a, a yearly variation. So uh, a day uh, in the winter um, will require from, from a, a huge demand on, on the gas network as compares, for example, a night in, in the summer. So we're trying to get anaerobic digestion not to be a, a, a one output kind of um, process, but actually be flexible and, 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 uh, and conduct that um, production to demand um, uh, management and we think we can do that by managing the the volatile fatty acid uh, uh, that you can concentrate and actually store and then just convert when when is required and and thanks for the the partners here uh, work is is going on uh, and we hope to have it at, at larger scale very shortly next slide please the same type of technique we actually feel that can um, be utilized uh, very much within uh, the agriculture sector. Um, there's a number of farms, uh, very small, uh, some of them, uh, and we feel that this technique could actually make uh, the, the resource of animal slurry come to AD uh, and, and, and be producing biomethane, um, hopefully shortly. At the same time, we can actually recover nitrogen and, and phosphate uh, and potentially reduce any biohazards um, in terms of, of or bacteria that could move out of farms uh, to a more centralized facility. So that's something we want to move on to to the next level as well. Next slide, please. Um, as, as Nick was mentioning, there's a lot of CO2 that's coming off uh, these uh, AD plants, but at the same time, there is need to integrate better the 
power from from solar, the power from marine and, and, and wind. And we feel that there is a huge synergy between uh, anaerobic processes and, and energy storage, especially for large scale. We are also very interested in looking at methane and CO2, not just from an energy storage perspective, an energy vector, but also feedstock to, to other processes as well. And we can see part of the anaerobic processes being linked with, say, biopolymer production production as well. So I'll just show very quickly what we've been doing in this area. Next slide, please. So one process that we've been developing is um, a conversion of hydrogen and CO2 to methane um, for gas uh, applications or for feedstock application, or actually a conversion to organic acids where these can be stored and then converted at later stage. So very, very quickly, this is what we've been looking at. And it's actually an ex situ. Uh, so it's not that we inject the hydrogen in the digesters, but we, we have a separate process that links into anaerobic digestion. And we We've got reasons to, to work this way. Next slide, please. Um, just quickly as well, uh, this was a project that we've done on the feasibility of such a process with Wessex Water, ITM. It was funded by Innovate UK, uh, BP and, and Wells and West Utilities. Um, and again, we, we, we are moving on uh, and I'll show you the next slide as well, please. A uh, biogrid project um, is coming to an end, um, although we, we hope to continue because we've actually had to stop lab operations for a while to, during to lockdown. Um, but this, this looks at bringing, raising the TRL of this process. So we've started for a number of years working on this. Um, we were about three to four um, TRL uh, about three years ago, and we think we, we're getting close to five and six and, and really looking for the next development at large scale. So we utilize um, CO2 and hydrogen uh, to produce carboxylic acids or, or methane directly, and that is going very well. Uh, thanks also for the funding from um, BASE in this case and, and the partners. Next slide, please. Um, we've got other interests as well, also in higher chain alkane gases, so uh, ethane, propane and butane. And we've started work, it's very interesting where, where we, we're finding uh, the science around these, uh, the higher chain production. Um, and then we'll bring you more, more uh, uh, of the developments uh, uh, next, next presentations. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, just so um, really to complement the area, we're very keen to utilize anaerobic processes for, for the biogas, for the methane, but also looking at can we actually convert the organic acids into, say, biopolymers in this case. This was from Stuart Sludge, and those are the type of polymers on the left that we can produce, polyhydroxic alkanoids. Uh, they concentrate within cells. Uh, you can see at the bottom there uh, the granules of polymer within, within the cells, and we can actually then couple it with, say, struva struvite recovery, the nutrient recovery. So that's another process that can be done uh, from, from the same organic resources. Just the next slide, please. Um, we're very keen to understand how biopolymers and the, a range of biopolymers actually digest in, 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 in anaerobic digestion. Um, we've, we've been working in this area for a couple of years and we know that some polymers, although is stated that can digest in, 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 in these processes, it, we know that they are actually manufactured slightly different. We can actually digest these very, very effectively. So we can bring a lot of carbon to these digesters that sometimes run at the high nitrogen content. Uh, we could be producing, say, uh, cardi liners uh, instead of having uh, problems with polymers or uh, at the end in terms of digest state, we can actually fully digest these materials. And perhaps this, the, the methane can actually then be utilized for more polymer production as well. Just at the bottom there of uh, the, 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 um, the graph at the bottom, we've utilized digest state as an inoculant source, so the nutrient media uh, for um, fermentation for biopolymer production. And if we actually optimize that, we can actually get a lot more polymer being produced. We're still understanding why we get this, but we feel digestate are, are really an undervalued product that if we do more, more um, 
uh, investigations, we can find very integrative um, interests with other technologies as well. So next slide, and I think it's probably coming to an end. You'll be glad. <laughs> Um, so we've done one more project as well, and, and we're very, very keen to understand because um, hydrogen and CO2 convergence to this polymer, polyhydroxyvalkanoate, has been mainly associated with aerobes. Uh, so we do fermentation aerobically and we can produce these polymers. What we're finding is actually we get these polymers being produced in anaerobic conditions, and we need to understand with the scope there, but also uh, how these polymers are accumulated, say, in, in conditions of stress, and we would like to understand a little bit better how, how, how these polymers actually help manage stress in digesters. And I think that's it for me. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, everything from uh, from production rates to process monitoring. Your uh, your process monitoring it, it did stri strike me. Um, I'm an engineer, but I give a lot of talks to chemists because I work in sustainability, especially green chemists. And I always ask them which of the 12 principles of green chemistry most surprises them. And they always say process control. I mean, what does that really matter? And I say, well, if we could increase the efficiency of uh, combustion and electricity production by 1%, yeah. we would um, eliminate more CO2 emissions than shutting down the entire chemical industry. So. It, it matters a lot, matters. And, uh, certainly in biological systems, you see these wild fluctuations and I see that and I think of just just how much uh, we're sort of wasting the uh, the process compared to chemical production, of course, much more, much more flat. So um, you're ambitious, I think, for trying to tackle that in AD. So thank you. That was great. Yeah. Um, our final speaker today is going to be before the panel discussion is going to be Dan Green from Wessex Water. So. Uh, Dan is going to give us um, a, a quite focused perspective on um, the UK water industry and how anaerobic digestion um, fits into that and uh, some of the challenges and opportunities um, that he sees. So whenever you're ready, thank you, Dan. Hi, have you got, uh, can you see my slides there? I'm, I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. Good, okay. Uh, they're not zoomed in yet. Uh, all right, I'll um, do a good slideshow. I still, I still just see your, your PowerPoint. I don't see the. Oh, there it is. Perfect. OK, good. All right. Um, thank you for the invitation, everyone. Um, my name is Dan Green. I work at Wessex Water. Um, we are a water and wastewater utility provider um, based uh, in the southwest of England, essentially the, the bit before you get to Devon and Cornwall. Um, so the, the urban areas around Bristol and Bath and uh, Bournemouth in the in the south, um, and incorporating sort of counties of Wiltshire, Dorset, Somerset, a little bit of Hampshire. So uh, that's where we're located. Um, I'm very much a generalist, um, uh, but uh, like like all kind of good generalists in my field who are a geographer by background, you're supposed to know a little bit about everything. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you what I know about our uh, the, the work we're doing on anaerobic digestion and linked to the circular economy. I'm linked in with uh, UK WIR, uh, Queer UK Water Industry Research, and uh, we'll get onto that uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so you've got a sense of sort of the research interests of water and wastewater companies in this area, uh, but I'll give you an overview of uh, standard practice in the industry and a bit of a case study of what we do at Wessex. So broadly speaking, what do we do with sewage sludge um, in uh, UK? Uh, most of it goes through anaerobic digesters. Some of it is limed still. Um, it's a bit of a, a sort of a hangover uh, from past practice, but but you know, talking about a good 80, 85% of, uh, of municipal sewage sludge going through anaerobic digestion of some form. Um, and then the digest state from that mostly goes to land, um, so farmland or land restoration. Uh, there is still some incineration, but uh, most of the incinerators are being wound down as well. Um, they were built in the in the early to mid 90s mainly, um, some into the kind of early 2000s, uh, and they're being replaced with other thermal technologies typically, um, or going back to uh, more advanced anaerobic uh, digestion. So the types of anaerobic digestion we have, the sort of the conventional units, uh, a 
uh, you know, sort of mesophilic anaerobic digesters. Um, but over the last 15 years, I'd say uh, we saw two broad types of more advanced uh, AD coming on stream. So the thermal hydrolysis plants, uh, the Canby process, the best known of those ones, and then um, operating at lower temperature, but uh, separating the acetogens from methanogens. Uh, you've got the uh, enzymic hydrolysis or the acid phase digestion uh, units, such as the one developed by Monsell. Um, and then in terms of end products, I've talked a bit about digestate. See, then there's the biogas. Um, and the standard method for that is to feed it into a combined heat and power engine. Uh, you use the electricity or you export the electricity and the heat you use to keep the anaerobic digesters at the operating temperature that they require. Um, but there's been a bit of diversification in the use of bio uh, biogas uh, in the last few years. Um, and we're now seeing more biomethane plants. Uh, so those that inject to the local gas grid or uh, use the biomethane for vehicles uh, as, as um, uh, an increasing feature. Still slightly experimental in places, but uh, you're talking about pilot plants, trials, uh, but um, I guess that's something we're going to see much more of. So in terms of Wessex Water, what have we been doing? Um, we've uh, over the years centralised our sewage sludge treatment centres, uh, so we now have just the five. We actually have um, nearly 400 sewage treatment works across our whole region. Most of them are very small. They operate at a village level. Um, but if you can imagine a sort of a hub and spoke uh, format at the county level, those village level plants will be uh, supplying sludge to a county level sludge treatment centre. Um, and so the ones we, we operate uh, at uh, Bristol, Trowbridge, um, on the outskirts of Bournemouth, there are a couple. There's one there and also neighbouring in Poole and then Taunton in, uh, in the west uh, in Somerset. Um, and we've had CHP attached to those anaerobic digesters for many, many years. Uh, the early 1960s in the case of Bristol, um, we invested in acid phase digestion, the Monsell process for Bristol first and then Trowbridge more recently. Um, We've added biomethane to grid, again, firstly at Bristol, where we're exporting about 10 million cubic meters a year, and uh, more recently at Trowbridge in the last couple of years. We're experimenting with biomethane to vehicles. There was a photograph of the, uh, the biobug, which was the, uh, the VW Beetle, which was a sort of a demonstration project several years ago. Uh, then uh, that was followed by the biobus, which operated in Bristol on the appropriately on the number two route. Um, and uh, we're looking at um, kind of lower carbon fleet generally, so that's going to be a mix of biomethane and electrification uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, we also digest food waste um, at Bristol uh, Water Recycling Centre um, at that sludge site. Uh, it's all separate, so there's no co-digestion. It's uh, in a, a separate uh, digester facility. Um, we're not leaving it there, though. There have been sort of discussions of other things which are around the circular economy theme. So we've talked quite a bit over the years with companies doing gasification and pyrolysis and producing biochar. We've got a, a goal to be uh, net zero carbon by 2030 and locking up organic material into char into an inert form like that has got to be one of the, the, the big wins if we can get a technology like that to work at an economic level. Um, we're looking, uh, we've been looking at algae from sewage primarily around the theme of phosphorus removal, but then that leads you into interesting areas of what you do with the algae downstream. Um, and also uh, with the assistance of the University of Bath and the, um, the WISE uh, Water Informatics uh, for Science and Engineering, uh, that uh, CDT, um, one of the PhD students there has been looking at higher value compounds that can be generated in, in an AD facility like uh, valeric acid or caprioic acid. So uh, looking ahead, a um, whole bunch of challenges and opportunities as we see it. Um, um, clearly getting to net zero carbon is a huge challenge. It's a huge uh, necessity, obviously. Um, but as well as the CO2, we've got to be looking at the methane and nitrous oxide associated with wastewater treatment and, and sludge treatment. 
there are all the concerns about uh, um, persistent organic compounds, microplastics, AMR, and that feeds into the whole issue around public perception. I mentioned that a large proportion of the sludge, the biosolids, the digestate that is produced goes to farmland uh, for growing crops. Um, and that is deemed by the Environment Agency to be the best environmental option at the moment. And there's an agreement with supermarkets about how that's done. Um, uh, but uh, there'll be kind of ongoing questions, I'm sure, about sort of the acceptability of that, um, uh, whether it can be secured in the long term or whether we need to pivot in, in any particular ways. Um, opportunities using biogas in a more diverse way. I've outlined some of the ways we're doing that already and integrating other organic waste streams to about food waste. And previously we just heard about uh, a farm slurry as well. So what are the options around that? Um, nutrient recovery, struvite formation is clearly a problem, but sort of can you purposefully recover uh, phosphorus and other nutrients from um, AD from the liquors in particular? Um, I've talked a bit about biochar um, and sort of other higher value organic chemicals and other sort of areas of value recovery. Now, yeah, clearly a lot of those opportunities are going to be very challenging, um, but uh, in the world of the circular economy, kind of those are, I think, deemed opportunities for which uh, there are some technical hurdles to be overcome. So the other thing to um, make you aware of, if you're not already aware of it, is Uquiz. Um, big question on uh, resource recovery and zero waste. Um, if you go to the Uquia website, there's um, a link at the bottom. You'll be able to see some more detail about that. So what's happened is that that um, there are 11 of these big questions that are informing the research program. This is Uquia is a combined research effort across all the water and wastewater companies. And there are route maps uh, forward to 2050 on the sorts of research projects uh, that want to be delivered. And uh, to finish off, um, this, uh, these are sort of two of the themes under that zero waste heading. Um, you've got sort of the generic, how do you describe, how do you understand the system type questions on the left and those sorts of research projects that will be coming forward. And then the sorts of techno technological approaches, uh, the waste streams that we'll be looking to valorize uh, in the years to come and optimizing the, the, the waste recovery that already happens. Um, so yeah, please do visit the Aquia website. You'll be able to see um, the, you'll be able to download a version of the route map and see in sort of full detail the questions that we are challenging ourselves with. That's me. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, I have to say one of the more interesting things I, I have witnessed in the AD field over the last few years is this transition from uh, or into more of a uh, fermentative uh, type approach. And by that, I mean, you, you highlighted and said it's Sandra, the um, higher value chemicals, you talk about valeric acid and other things and the, the opportunities there. Yeah. Um, so more thinking about what comes out and when, when I first became aware of AD, you know, 20 years ago, it was sort of a way of making things go away. Yeah. <laughs> now it's becoming, we don't want this anymore, let's make it go away. Yeah, and yeah. now it's becoming a, a, a truly a, a conversion technology in its own right. And um, I, th I think that's, uh, it's quite encouraging. Mm, indeed. So thank you. That is the, uh, the final one of our uh, expert presentations. Um, and so next we're going to have sort of a a combined round table of ideas for the call. So we're going to call on our, our all of our speakers to help the Supergem Bioenergy Hub um, scope this upcoming, uh, the details for this upcoming funding call on uh, amor and I almost got through it, anaerobic digestion. Um, I'm going to try and kick things out off and sort of seed the discussion by, by uh, mentioning uh, one or two of the questions that the audience has brought in. And for those of you in the audience or even on the panel, if you want to ask a question, please do, uh, please do bring it up. Um, but there, there was, there was been some excellent questions already. The, the first one that really came to my attention was from Martin's talk. Uh, or came in during Martin's talk. I assume it was related to Martin's talk, but it was uh, sort of about the interplay of energy from waste, and I guess what you could say is 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 how how good or bad is this, right? So if you start thinking about LCA or life cycle assessment type approaches, um, how much is this about reducing CO two emissions, and how much is this about uh, maximizing value recovery? So 
Um, do, do we want to sort of have a, a bit of a let Martin start it off on, on where you see um, sort of the, the balance there tipping? OK, uh, let me let me have a go. But um, and I think uh, Patricia has has had a good go at this answer already. But uh, let me uh, let me just amplify what she she has said there. Um, I mean, I think uh, so, so, so the, the comment was of something about the aesthetics, uh, the architectural aesthetics uh, being the, the, the main selling point of this uh, this plant in um, in Copenhagen. I, 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 to be to be honest, I think it's much more than that. Um, <laughs> the designers of the plant have worked really hard to maximize its efficiency. And so you've got everything. Uh, including heat pumps in the uh, in the chimney stack to make sure that you're extracting the most heat waste that you can. Um, so it's a, it genuinely is a state of the, the art. But I think the point is, uh, is energy from waste the best that we can do or the current incarnation of energy from waste plants? And the answer is no. And that uh, what we should be moving for is a, a moving towards is a much more sophisticated management of our waste streams, uh, and that requires much more segregation uh, and uh, be better processing of that that segregated waste. So uh, I think that's where we want to get to, but we need to recognise that energy from waste plants are going to have a have a role in, in the near. The, the bit about life cycle analysis is. And, and I think it was a we, we had a covered couple of evidence gather, gathering sessions as part of the policy commission. Um, one member of industry uh, who I won't name um, observed that, uh, and this is kind of Patricia's comment. There is uh, there there are there are lies, dam lies, and and life cycle analysis, uh, and. I think it's really hard to get the life cycle analysis done in a way which is truly objective. Many, many companies, businesses will tell you that they've done their life cycle analysis and their better technology is better than whatever else is on the market. Um, uh, uh, and there are good um, pieces of academic work which show that actually the, the, the complexity around like life cycle analysis and, and getting it done in a, a way which is independent, reliable. I, I, you know, I think there is a big need for this to be done in a way which is objective uh, and uh, is taken out of the hands of business uh, and, and in part feeds into uh, a national centre for the circular economy. Because in order to make proper decisions about which direction we need to move in terms of our waste processing and uh, and recycling, uh, we need we need to have that objective uh, analysis and, and proper data. Oh, great, thank you, Martin. I, I, for, first, I would, I would agree with you. Um, the uh, I mean, I, I only believe the LCA studies that suggest that my technologies are better than everybody else's, and so I have, a, I have a selective bias there. But it's a very very specific one. But if I can turn that sort of around into a more general topic for discussion. Ignoring the LCA aspect for, for the moment, um, how should we be balancing in this sector the idea of making things from so so the waste treatment from the manufacturing, I guess you could say, because of course, chemical manufacturing, especially for high value chemicals is very, uh, what's the right word, it's not a great way of reducing mass, I guess you could say, and there is there is still a, a need um, for, for the bulk um, production. So so how, how did those challenges, how do we mesh those two into an industry that of course has to maintain a fixed footprint, I guess you could say. I can have a go at just sort of kicking that off in terms of context. I mean, I think generally what, what I've observed, how, how these things work is that um, yes, there'll be interest in innovating um, and trying new things out, um, but we can't change a process overnight. So it's very, it tends to be very incremental. You'll have a side stream of a process maybe that's fed through the, the, the new device or the new process that you're testing out. But at a, at a large municipal sewage treatment works in a sludge treatment center, we can't turn off the tap of the stuff that's coming in. Um, so uh, it, we've got thousands of tons of sewage sludge arriving every day. Um, and we just need to keep 
running that through the process that we currently have. So the incumbent system tends to work until you know, it goes, it breaks down completely. And, and so far that hasn't happened yet with conventional AD. Um, um, it's you know, when, when there's evidence that you can replace it with um, a more efficient version of the theme. That's what you've seen with the with the Canby process and Monsel process coming on stream in terms of the really sort of advanced, sophisticated uh, substance uh, extraction technologies. It's going to be it's going to be happening sort of pretty small scale um, for the foreseeable future. Now, you know, that, I hope that doesn't sound terribly unambitious because we can see, you know, that, that, that there is value and potential and uh, but, but but please don't expect that a whole set to just a pivot overnight to be coming kind of multi-stream, multi-output refineries, biorefineries. You know that, that that's the vision long term, but um, but it's going to be a fairly incremental, gradual process, I think. Let's oh, say, Sandra, I think you were going to make a point. Yeah, I, yeah, I could add a couple of words there. Um, I, I actually agree. Uh, totally what's been said before. Um, I, I feel that it's it's um, uh, not an opportunity to wait uh, for something to be fully developed um, in, in order not to, to invest in other technologies in between that may be already developed. So finding that, you know, uh, government or, or, or companies are waiting 20 or 30 years for something to come to um, you know, to a fully fleshed technology that can be deployed at, at full scale. Um, it's not adequate. We should be moving along with with the technologies that uh, that uh, come to fruition. Um, I, I feel that in most cases, government sometimes waits for something to come out and, and, and deliver it. But um, I really feel that we should be moving into uh, an intermediate uh, technologies as they come come along and just just now putting back bioenergy because we could be going on to a more chemical um, perspective uh, in my view is, is incorrect because those chemical perspectives are not yet here with us and can be developed at full scale as such so capturing uh, uh, technologies as they move along. I think that's that's the way to go. We, we've we've not made huge developments at all, say, for example, in engines for nearly 100 years. <laughs> um, and, and, and I question why, you know, there needs to be in between technologies uh, to be moving forward to a better one, uh, just waiting for science uh, and, and development to come up with a fully fleshed technology. It might be a, a bit late. And, and I think we are in the situation we are because for for many, many years, nothing came along that was was improving things. Anyway, that's that's my view. If, if I, um, I don't know if I can chip in here. I mean, I, I agree completely with that. Uh, I think a real, the real challenge that we have in supporting the emergence of new technologies is supporting the emergence of new technologies uh, that we, uh, uh, we fund collectively, fund early stage R&D really well um, uh, and through perhaps to the, the scale up, but really uh, to to build confidence uh, in organisations like like Wessex Water that uh, they've got a technology that they can plug into their system, you need to to pilot, uh, and you need to be able to pilot for a significant amount of time, which demonstrates that the technology not only works on day one but also works a couple of years later, uh, and hence is something that you can take through into deployment. Uh, at the uh, we, we used to have organizations like ETI who used to fund uh, those kinds of pilot scale um, uh, demonstrations. Uh, we don't at the moment. Uh, there really is an, a national need to be a bit more brave around uh, supporting demonstration phase of, uh, of technologies. Uh, and the moment uh, the funding for that is not easy to get hold of. Uh, and many companies end up going bankrupt That's during right. the time which they are trying to demonstrate their technology. Uh, and we're just mi missing out as a um, as a community uh, with a potential for taking real uh, real leadership in 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 a space which is going to be really important in the in the future globally. 
I think that's a good point. Maybe from, again, a selfish perspective, as somebody who has a company going through a demonstrator right now, a commercial demonstrator, um, it is quite painful. And I, I guess I would turn that around into a question maybe for Nick. Um, it, how much of this is a deployment issue and how much of this is a de-risking issue? I mean, is it is it a question of industry thinking that the technology is de deployable right now or do we need to do more work on establishing um, that there, there's a low risk in switching over? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think probably realistically it, it's, it's a bit of both. Um, you know, this is a ready to use technolo technology that's been deployed successfully for, well, decades now, but really successfully over the last 10 years. And yeah, there's lots of uh, room for improvement throughout the entire system. And um, yeah, it's just about making sure that that system is working to meet the needs of the, the UK. There are plenty of sectors that need decarbonisation. And AD is actually an unusual or relatively unusual technology because it can tackle multiple different sectors at the same time. Um, so I think it's just about identifying those opportunities and really drawing that, maximising the value out of it. And I think that's where it's also important to always ensure that it's linked with uh, sort of policy and regulation to make sure that that, that minimum standard, you know, for, for maybe digestate, what, what are the minimum standards required to ensure that, you know, it's sustainably used, it doesn't lead to any sort of unforeseen knock-on effects. Um, and, you know, use, you know, balancing that between, you know, regulation and drawing out that 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 maximum value from from our resources that are produced and will always be produced um so i think i think drawing on your point about the the chemical industry as well is is there aren't many um sustainably sourced products such as biomethane um that can start decarbonizing these fossil based um industries or or, or sort of rooted in in fossil products um, so I think it's yeah it's it's really important to start you know using using the technology we already have available to uh, decarbonize these processes. And you mentioned you mentioned policy. I mean, how, how widespread is the policy issues? There? I mean, I, I'm always reminded I, I talked to somebody. I won't mention which government, but I talked to somebody in the uh, transport sector of a government who told me that we didn't need. We were I was talking about bioethanol from wastewood, and they said we didn't need bioethanol because we were going to decarbonize the electricity, uh, decarbonize the transport sector with electric cars. And I said that I was unaware that it was already 2050. Um, so you know, how, how much of the policy challenges are sort of balancing the, the short and long term visions of governments and, and thinking about the, the that, as you mentioned, that transition um, in, in terms of that space? Yeah, I mean, I've ever in, instrumental. I mean, like as I mentioned in the um, in my presentation, you know, fundamentally the AD industry relies on its subsidies. So ultimately it, it hinges on the government policy in place. Um, so that that's something that is a barrier. And, you know, the more we can move away from the reliance on government policy, um, you know, while sticking within the regulation available, that, that, that is a more organic growth within the industry that that's more, that sort of meets the needs more, um, dynamically it's you know it's flexible and, and can sort of adapt um i would say as well though i think sort of sandra mentioned it as well is there is a there seems to be a a, a desire from the government to sort of knock it down in the timeline you know innovation will overcome these problems you know the solutions are just on the horizon so we can wait but really we need to be spending money and investing and you know causing this disruption immediately i think uh there's this sort of one way of of looking at it is we can either reduce total emissions by say one ton now or by 30 tons in 30 years time you know it's accumulative so it's better to sort of get that decarbonization now because it's only going to get harder to sort of get to the same level the, the, the longer we leave it so um you know we, we've got these technologies now that we, we we just need to get on and use. Okay. So, 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 uh, you know, I think uh, for this sector, um, a green gas obligation could be <laughs> really helpful. So just do 
obligate that there should be pick a number 30 percent 50 percent on the gas network of green gas and you can figure out how you make that green gas it could be hydrogen it could be biomethane but actually that could be an intervention which really helps uh, drive the sector in, in the right direction um, so so you know i think there are policy interventions which can uh, in the future really uh, really help in the in terms of the transition that we need to go through in terms of greening greening our gas system and and that's the sort of thing i think uh, uh, organizations like uh, like yours nick should be should be pushing for yeah, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that. So the, the government have already announced a green gas levy, which will assert, act, um, you know, very similar to a green gas obligation, a bit like as well the, the renewable transport fuel obligation. So, um, so certainly these sorts of mechanisms are being put in place and with any luck should really help, um, you know, support the industry. Yeah, and it was having biomethane and the renewable heat incentive that, that led us to pivot uh, at Bristol uh, to um, having that as the main end use of biogas rather than uh, turning into electricity. Mm. Yeah, the renewable heat incentive, I, I do think, had quite an impact. Um, there was a lot of pushback in the, in the chat on LCA. I work on LCA, so don't don't, don't think that I don't like LCA. Um, I'm, I'm quite, quite a big fan, but uh, there's an excellent question there about um, the difference between traditional LCA looking at the cradle to grave and how that can be adapted to the circular economy and the cradle to cradle approach. And I, I guess I would frame that, um, you know, how much of a challenge is it for us to properly value, I guess, the back end of that? And uh, I always think of industries like mining where, you know, the environmental emissions from mining are so far away that actually recycling metal in the UK isn't all that incentivized because actually the mining takes place somewhere else, so we don't have to worry about it. So how do we sort of close the loop on that such that we properly value not sending things to the grave? Yeah, I know, that's a good one. Well, it sounds like, Jason, you're in the best place to answer that question. <laughs> oh, 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 unfortunately. No, the, mo the, the, the panel moderator doesn't answer questions, I'm sorry. I only ask them, so. <laughs> Well, given so that you work, you've given you work on this stuff, but uh, I think I think you 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 you've already uh, put yourself in the chair of being able to answer it. Well, I think I think actually Patricia made even even a better point there than than, than I could um, about KPIs. But I, I guess it, it is a similar idea, right? I mean, our, our our key performance indicators in in this industry. I mean, what exactly are they in in the sense of? I guess we mentioned the RHI as an example, right? I mean, is the is this all about CO2 emissions? Is this all about not landfilling things? Martin's slide, I was stunned if, if you want the big difference between Sweden and the UK is that we're, we're sending 17% of stuff to landfill. They appear not to have any landfills. So, I mean, what what is the KPI that we really need here? Is it utilization? Is it emissions reduction? Or is it uh, energy independence or energy security? So yeah. mixture of all three. Mixture of all three. Oh, that's that's it's a pop out. That's it's a pop out. Which one we need? I, I need uh, which which one's the which one's the looking forward? Which one's the one that's going to put the UK at the forefront of uh, of this uh, this revolution? And, and I think I think it's really challenging, isn't it? Because uh, what what are the waiting? So so Sandra's right. I mean, what, it's it's not it's not. Uh, one alone, but what is the weighting factor that you put, put on each of these? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's not that one is going to be so important that you dismiss everything else. Um, and, and in some ways that will depend on what the policy environment is that you're in. Um, and so there's kind of a scientific perspective, but also you know, there's a real world perspective, which is how uh, these things have got to work in that policy environment. Uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, in the end, I think it's going to be for me an equal weighting of how you maximise the potential that you get out of the resource that you have. Um, so to ensuring that uh, and it could be maximum energy extraction uh, as an example of that, um, but also balancing that with the, the carbon emissions that you're creating. And it's either the carbon emissions that you're creating during the processing 
or then subsequent oh. use of that fuel that you've created. <coughs> Biomethane, you're burning the gas, and which is creating CO2. So, so I, I, at the moment, in the current policy environment, see that you would weight the things more or less equally. In my view, that there's always risks when you start weighing um, aspects of uh, of uh, benefits, uh, because if if you look at AD as a globalized potential uh, market, um, you know the the actual benefits that we might want from the technology in the UK it might be different from Africa or Asia or South America or whatever. Uh, and I, I think th there will be regional uh, national aspects that will will uh, highlight certain benefits more than others. Uh, and I think if, if we look at the industry as a potential also exporter, um, many other aspects come into into the equation. I don't know, the contamination of soils, used digestate might be more valuable there, um, or, or the, the, the biogas or, or biomethane, say, in India or China, that are, are increasing a huge demand for, uh, for their uh, natural gas uh, um, networks. Uh, you might look at other countries where it says, well, we've got a huge investment in wind, and, you know, solar, etc., power, so bioenergy, might want to turn into more with the biorefinery and the chemical aspects. I think I think we actually see throughout the world different needs and different mm. positions where the technology can be implemented and deliver. Um, so that's good in a way. Mm. <laughs> it brings challenges because sometimes that funding that we might require for the demonstrators and even from Pew Research um, might not sell under the current policies in the UK, but as an application for it could have a much bigger value uh, and as an import uh, export uh, yeah. if we did that research too. So I think, yeah, it, it's it's quite, it's complex, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think um, geography definitely does matter. Um, um, for me, greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity, uh, the two global crises that, that probably trump everything. Um, and to be able to address those in, in economic, socially just ways, um, has to be the priority um, and you know sort of comparing one one energy input and energy output with another one is is tricky when you're comparing electrical units with thermal units and so on but if it boils back down to the to the co2 or the greenhouse gas emissions in in the round then that seems to me a pretty good basis for comparison okay. yeah I was gonna say I completely agree with that yeah I um, well, I agree with everything that's actually been said before, but yeah, I think carbon emissions is a really good way of, of, or at least the foundation of any sort of LCA analysis and in into it, because where 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 AD strength is is it's not just a power generator. You can't compare it directly to a wind farm, um, and you know it's kind of you've got to therefore compare against different scenarios, compare about different technologies. Where what is the LCA? The LCA of an AD plant on its own may not mean much, but it's when you compare it to landfill, when you compare it to even compost or incineration, um, that's where you sort of see the value getting drawn out. Um, you know, and, and, and carbon emissions as can be like quite a global proxy, um, you know, from the nutrients in digestate to the energy, whether it's electricity or, or biomethane, you know, these are all different um, useful outputs that can be quantified through their carbon savings. I think I think the LCA discussion of the LCA perspective, I think is quite helpful here in, in terms of how we frame the challenge also. And um, certainly during this panel discussion and during <laughs> this last round of, of uh, questions, we, we sort of highlighted the, the intersection here, the interplay of, of a lot of different elements from CO2 emissions, bioenergy, waste management. You know, you can judge a society by how it handles its waste. And, and even talking about land spread, which um, uh, one of the scariest things I, I've learned in the last few years is that the UK has 30 years of topsoil left. So uh, what are we going to do 30 years from now? What are we going to eat? Right. That type of thing. Um, it's, I, I don't I think I think we've, we've exhausted most of the questions from the audience. So I, I guess the, the, the closing question I would have for each of our panel members then um, so, sort of a, a one sentence or uh, what do you think is the big challenge we should be scoping this call around? So what's what's the one thing that would in, in research terms so of academic sort of to industry um, type of research challenge that would really help us um, frame the the intersection of bioenergy and, and anaerobic digestion. Uh, 
I'm happy to kick off. Um, sure. We uh, the water, water sector is um, in the process of developing a innovation strategy, a uh, national innovation strategy, um, covering full spread of our activity. Um, and we've been consulting on the draft and uh, we've held a, a bunch of workshops uh, with a range of stakeholders. And uh, consistently across the workshops where we've asked the question, which of the goals that we're working towards would have most impact, which is going to be the most challenging, uh, which is likely to have the greatest costs associated with it. It's net zero carbon. Um, and that is the th of the, the various goals and objectives that we have as a sector. That's the one I think people are saying, right, we've we've got 10 years to, to really crack this. Um, and we're going to have to devote a heck of a lot of focus and effort on it. And, and I think the, the sector that you're all working in has got a huge amount to play uh, as part of that story. Net zero carbon is always a, is a huge challenge, as you say. Uh, I guess I, I'll, uh, I'll add to that point and, uh, and sort of yeah, join, <laughs> join from there. Is yet yeah, completely agree. I think net, z net zero um, as a target and getting on track with that. And I, I guess the, the the nut to crack is is how it integrate is integrated within um, other systems and how it feeds in. AD is not going to be the only solution, and it's not the only technology. So how do we optimize the the resources we have available and start from that bottom? We have all these wastes. Let's get the most out of them and make sure that through that entire pathway, the the output of the industry is a. Uh, also is most most efficiently used. I can add, uh, how do we drive innovation within that time scale? I think that's the question because mm -hmm. as uh, Dan uh, from Sex Water was mentioning, I think the, 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 the ambition is uh, net zero carbon by 2030, if I'm not mistaken, isn't it? What, uh, what the sector is aiming at that. So that's 10 years. From Martin, uh, we could gather that there is very little money or for demonstrators um, to, to drive that aspect. So how, how do we get there <laughs> very quickly without that support? I think having that gate fees or energy uh, related fees uh, for, or, or, or incentives for uh, the technology itself is important, but that, that um, um, development work for the innovation needs to be there as well, especially if we aim to do quite different things in, by 2013, 2040. Um, so, yeah. That's an interesting point, especially as an academic, right? I mean, if, if the answer is in my laboratory, it's not going to be uh, co completely converting the UK water industry 10 years from now. That's, uh, that's, that's not, not a realistic time scale. Martin, do you have any last thoughts? Well, uh, only to reflect how impressed I was with the uh, the things that are happening already uh, and in terms of thinking through what a programme might look like, I think a lot of things that Sandra was talking about uh, clearly fit really well into into such a such a programme in the future. Um, and there's there's a lot of uh, science challenges there that um, could could be part of the mix as what a future solution looks like. Um, it, it, more broadly, I think the challenge is that organic waste streams can be uh, processed in lots of different ways. Um, so you can do anaerobic digestion, you can do take them and put them through pyrolysis or whatever you like. Um, and and the, in the end, one has to be able to make sensible decisions about what, what one does with your resource stream. Uh, and I think part of this uh, could be thinking through what is, we've just been talking like, about life cycle analysis, uh, and maybe this work exists already and I, I, I'm just not aware of it, but really being able to understand how, if you've got an organic waste stream, what is the best way of utilising that organic waste stream? Um, and how do you maximise the benefits then of, of pyrolysis, uh, of anaerobic digestion in, in, in that uh, in that environment. Okay, great, thank you. Then I also highlight there was an, and while 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 we were all talking, there was an excellent question came in, in the chat, or excellent point really that came in on the chat about about how Canby took ten years, even with a 
keeping with a willing industrial partner. And it's, it still wasn't an overnight transition. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge. We're being very ambitious about our, our timelines and all of this. Um, but I, I, I find that refreshing um, because uh, if, we're gonna, if it's going to take 30 years for, for change, it's probably too late. Um, I'd like to close then, I guess, uh, by thanking especially all of our panel members, but also our audience. Um, but uh, it was a nice, lively discussion, and I appreciated the different uh, perspectives. Um, and uh, I certainly uh, learned a lot today, and I enjoyed it. Um, and I, I think that's going to help us quite a bit in Supergen in terms of trying to bring sort of AD into into the fold and uh, into our remit and um, and scoping out this upcoming call, which for those of you that are that are interested, um, there should be should be a call issued uh, in about two weeks. Emma's coming back on, so she's going to say something. But uh, no, she's not. OK, on next. October 5th, you could look uh, look for the the issuance of the of the um, of the funding call. So. Thank you, everyone. Um, Dan, I have no idea how to end this, but uh, but I, I think I think we're finished. I'd say Dan Taylor, Dan. Uh, but uh, but thank you all for participating. Thank you. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.